Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's special Lunch and Learn program, which is also part of our annual Day of Learning. Welcome to the many teachers who are joining the program today. For the teachers participating in the Day of Learning, this is one of five sessions they can attend throughout the day to further explore topics about genocide. At these sessions, teachers are given practical ideas that can be easily implemented into the classroom. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Seattle, Washington, the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. Seattle is also home to the third largest Cambodian American community in the United States, with over 18,000 people, according to the Pew Research Center. Please let us know where you are joining us from in the chat. And if you are a teacher, please also let us know where you teach. Boutros Boutros Ghali served as the Secretary General of the United Nations from 1992 to 1996. I read a quote by him years ago that stuck with me. He said, for us, genocide was the gas chamber. What happened in Germany? We were not able to realize that with the machete, you can create a genocide. The word genocide was coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish-born lawyer who had fled the persecution of the Holocaust and moved to the United States in 1941. Lemkin lost most of his family in the Holocaust. He recognized that mass murder was not new and he spent the remainder of his life trying to create language and laws to help prevent these atrocities. Genocide is not something that happens overnight or without warning, and understanding genocide and the warning signs can help us to intervene. The Early Warning Project is a fantastic and thorough group that is tracking risk factors of genocide. They have on their website, and we'll put the link in the chat, an incredible map that outlines and shows the countries that are at the highest risk of genocide or that are currently experiencing genocide. Again, check the chat for the link to the map. One of the many countries in which genocide has occurred since the Holocaust is Cambodia. Between 1974 and 1979, the Khmer Rouge murdered 1.5 to 2 million people, nearly a quarter of Cambodia's population. The Khmer Rouge seized power in 1975 and aimed to turn the country into an agrarian socialist republic. They emptied the cities and forced Cambodians to relocate to labor camps in the countryside, where mass executions, forced labor, physical abuse, and disease were rampant. One of the survivors of the Cambodian genocide is Luang Ong. Luang was just a child at the time. Through her work later in life, writing, and activism, Luang shares how she was able to reclaim her voice redeem herself and to stand against injustices. A lifelong activist, Luang is a public speaker, best-selling author of the book, First They Killed My Father, and additional books, Lucky Child and Lulu in the Sky. For her work, the World Economic Forum selected Luang as one of the 100 Global Youth Leaders of Tomorrow. She has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, People Magazine, CNN, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and The Today Show. Luang's book, First They Killed My Father, has been translated into 15 languages and is read around the world. For all of the teachers joining us, you might be interested to know that teacher guides for the book are available. And there's a link in the chat to Luang's website where you can find all this great information to support your lessons. Luang's outstanding bestseller memoir, First They Killed My Father, became a critically acclaimed 2017 movie directed by Angelina Jolie. We are going to watch the trailer to the movie, which is just a couple minutes. And then we are so honored to welcome Luang to the program who will be joining us remotely from Vermont. Luang will take questions from attendees at the end of the program. And please type your questions at any time into the Q&A option on Zoom. With that, we will now show the film. Won't end from the U.S. 
Luang, we are so honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining this program. Such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I really want to give a shout out to all the teachers and educators out there. I am grateful to be speaking to you. I am grateful for you. I'm grateful you've chosen your professions. And um, you know, I, I have to say teachers have been such inspirations, aspirations, mentors, heroes of mine of all through my life. I'm actually calling from my niece Maria's house in Burlington, Vermont, and she is a teacher as well. She, she teaches chemistry at a high school nearby. Um, and and I'm, I'm really grateful for, for, in particular, for two teachers, and, um, and they're both, they're both are, to this day, friends of mine. One is Mrs. Knapp, my, um, oh, Mrs. Costello, actually, my third grade teacher who introduced me to this thing called the library card. What an amazing thing this little piece of card is, was the library card. I remember in Cambodia when my brother um, in, in 1970s, when they wanted the library card, they actually had to join the Hare Krishna group just so they could access the libraries where we could have all these books. And I and with my library card, um, as, as long as I had it, I was never bored. I was never bored. I was never lonely. I was never, I never felt out of place. I always felt life was larger and more expansive and more broad because of the library card. Um, I'm also internally grateful to Mr. Ellis Severance, my sixth grade teacher, who for the very first time in my life, when um, he gave us the assignment to write uh, uh, our stories. And I wrote my, a little story about my experience of growing up in Cambodia. And in all my papers up until that point, I was so used to getting the, the grades back where you know, there were so many red marks. And Mrs. Severance actually gave me an A++ for my assignment. And of course, I went up to him after class and I said, Mr. Severance, you, you must be wrong. I, you, you were maybe not paying attention because I am not an A plus student. I never have been. I've never been an A plus plus student for sure. And he looked at me and he said, until you fix your grammar and learn how to write, you will not get this again. But for this once, I want to let you know that contents sometimes count more than correct grammar. And he encouraged me to keep writing, to put my thoughts and feelings and story into my journal. And he, Mr. Severance was the reason that I wrote my into my journals, which eventually I turn into my books. And so wow. thank you so much to all the teachers out there. And thank you so much for tuning in. Wow, that is quite a story. I hope we can have you ever told this to your teacher? Have you ever been able to contact these teachers and tell them how influential they were? 
Mrs. Knapp and Mrs. Costello. I'm actually having dinner with Mrs. Costello tonight. She's oh, yeah, yeah, she's 89 years old, and I'm going over to her house, her house for dinner, and Mrs. Knapp and Mr. Severance, and um, I visited his class when my book came out, when First They Killed My Father came out, and I dedicated, he was one of the person I dedicated the book to, and I surprised him in class, and Mr. Severance, first of all, is, I think he's seven feet tall, and so he is a giant, but he was also a teacher when it was a student's birthday who would sing to us and who would, um, for as, as big as he was, because his heart was so large and his compassion was so great and his generosity was so large that he felt relatable, that mm -hmm. he felt human, even though he was a giant in life and in his profession. Wow. I mean, you're... Your book has touched the lives of so many people and your story, but it's also your openness and your honesty and you, just your ability to bring people in, bring people into you and your journey. And I, can, you, can you tell us what you were, so you started with these journals and then what inspired you to write this book? I love to read. I love books. I, I read all the time. I, I read everything with the exception of how to's and romance novels. <laughs> I was never able to get into romance novels, mostly because the protagonists to me were never strong enough and were never active enough in their own, in the making of their own life, mm -hmm. in the writing of their lives. And, um, and, and, and for me, I, I always kept the journal and the a writer writes, a published writer will seek out to get his or her or their published, their works to for various different reasons. And for me, it started because my parents inspired me to try to get my story out. I wanted to tell the story because my father's not here to tell it. I wanted to tell our story because I wanted my nieces and nephews to know their grandparents that they will never get to meet in this lifetime. I wanted them to know these wonderful people who tried so hard to be here, but didn't live and didn't make it out of the killing fields of Cambodia alive. And so for me, it really, I was inspired to try to publish my work because I wanted my parents' hearts and I wanted their, I wanted their stories to be known to their, to, to their descendants. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, a, as a person who actually journals, the person who inspired me to journal all of my life was um, Viktor Frankl's. And when I was going through a very, very difficult time from when I was turning 15 to 16, I, I suffered um, as my body was changing from that of a young girl to a young woman. And my mind was just firing in all the different directions and my thoughts and my emotions and the physical pain as, as I was changing. I became very sad and depressed. And Mrs. Costello, I believe, was the one who actually gave me a book, and the book would change my life, and it was Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. In Man's Search for Meaning, I learned two things that, that were so instrumental in my healing. One was that I was not alone. I was not alone. To be able to read the stories of just the survivors out there and what we had to do. And then also logo therapy and the art of writing as, as a therapeutic tool, the art of taking the traumas. And, and at this point in my life, and when I was depressed, when I was sad, the traumas of what I experienced existed as this large, massive, dark clouds floating over my head that followed me around. And every time I was triggered, the clouds would... What just what what just triggered um, lightnings and thunders and storms and rains and it would just covered me mm. in ways I couldn't really dictate or predict or manage or control. But with my pens, 
through the teaching of Viktor Frankl's in Man's Search for Meaning, I could take the pen and I could pierce the dark clouds and I could one by one pull one thread of a story out at once. And that was manageable. And I could write that story down onto the pages of my journal and that was manageable. And so I literally had to do it one story at a time and not all of it and not feeling all of it at once, which was what triggered me. That's that's an incredible that's an just an incredible image of being able to pull the stories and the words just one at a time like that. Um, there were a couple questions in the chat. It looks like it it got it was answered, but it's Victor Frankel, Man's Search for Meaning, is the book. Um, can you Luong tell us a little bit about your family and what your life was like in Phnom Penh before the Khmer Rouge? I grew up in Cambodia in a tiny little country, the size of the state of Oklahoma. And, and um, I think most people know Cambodia as the infamous killing fields that were um, the, the, of the Khmer Rouge era. But for me, growing up in Cambodia, my Cambodia was beautiful. My Cambodia through the child's point of view growing up there was full of mythologies and magic and monkey kings and um, Naga princess. And um, my Cambodia was also green, so green that to this day, I've yet to find a green crayon in that box of 164 to fill in its scenery. My Cambodia was dotted and, and with bougainvillea paper flowers of all different colors of lotus flowers that bloom in the darkest and thickest and murkiest mud and puddles. And so my Cambodia, when I looked at it, the way our eyes are similar to computers, felt satisfied. My lenses, the lenses of my eyes felt satisfied as if the pixels themselves were fully saturated with colors. My Cambodia was populated by my father, who um, was a military police officer and a businessman, and therefore was able to, uh, we were able to have and live a life of privilege, where my mother, who was five at five seven, was an Amazon in a society. My Cambodia was populated by three beautiful sisters, um, and who I fought with and played with so often and loud that my father threatened three places with monkeys. And with three brothers, as you could see in the pictures, who were so cool, and, and at least they thought they were cool, but we were a large family. And we spent our days going to school six days a week um, and, and studying Cambodian, English, French, Chinese. My father was an advocate of education. My father was not able to go to school as a young child, a person. And so when we were with us, he made sure we all went to school. Um, it was a charmed life. We, we were together. We spent our days together and then go into the Buddhist temple. Um, my Cambodia was populated by 90% of whom were Buddhists and 90% of us lived off the land, growing our own food. But that life would come to an end on April 17th, 1975, when I was five years old, the day the communist Khmer Rouge storm into our countries with their guns and their grenades and their dark shirts and their dark pants and their big, bright, wild smiles. And and what was it what was it like when they once they came in, what 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 was it like when this takeover started? But was it like a war? Was there fighting? And can you tell us a little bit of a little bit about the Khmer Rouge, what did they stand for and why, why were they taking over? I was five years old at a time, so I did not know the Khmer Rouge politics. I didn't know their policies. I did not know that the Khmer Rouge as the uh, uh, communist group had been in existing in Cambodia since the 1940s and fighting against the Khmer Rouge, the, the monarchy in Cambodia. I didn't know about the U.S. war that was happening in, in Vietnam and how it crossed over in 1970. I did not know about what the villagers and my parents knew about the B-52 metal killing birds as we came to know them. We didn't know about the planes, so we called them B-52 
to metal killing birds that would zoom into the sky and drop bombs that later researchers would realize that during the bombing campaigns in Cambodia, over 500 tons of bomb dropped in Cambodia's countryside. More bombs were dropped in Cambodia than all of the bombs dropped by the allies in Japan during World War II. Mm -hmm. I did not know about the Khmer Rouge who came, who came to power believing they wanted to take Cambodia as a nation back to the golden years, the year zero, when Cambodia was a superpower, when the Khmer Empire would, had land that really was, um, had land that, that, that con consisted all of Cambodia in South Vietnam and into Siam. Um, we didn't know about all of this. When the Khmer Rouge came in, they came in to our streets, in their trucks and start pulling out their bullhorns, start screaming for us to leave our home, the homes, to pack as little as we could to sustain us for three days. Because they said the Americans were coming, were coming in with their planes. And then they were gonna bomb the city and if we didn't leave, we would all be killed. It was the first lie I remember the Khmer Rouge soldiers telling us or telling me. Cambodia, particularly in my city, Phnom Penh, populated by 2 million people, was evacuated in 72 hours. Wow. I didn't know this at a time, but I remember so clearly the anxiety, the stress, the fear, the quickness of my mother's steps as she ran around the house, packing food in pots and pans and clothes. We didn't know we were gonna have to leave. And it would be years four years before we could go back to our house because when we left, along with the two million Cambodians, we all poured into the street. We didn't know where to go. We just moved because the soldiers with their guns were standing on either side of the roads telling us to just move and move. And those people who refused, people in a hospital, people who were too old, people who were too pregnant, people who were too weak or sick, people who couldn't walk, we were heard and we were told and we could hear the gunfires of them being harmed and killed and executed in their homes and in their door in, in, at their doorsteps. And so we left. Cambodia on that day became a prison and all the 7 million people in Cambodia became prisoners. And one by one, during the four, three years, eight months and 20 days of our prison, imprisonment, we would have our rights one by one being taken away. You, you were just a small child. I mean, you were only five when this happened. And I, I try to imagine your mother with, you know, your brothers and sisters and trying to get all of these children to safety. What, where, where did your family end up? Where did you go as you were all um, being moved to another place? We walked for seven days. And I remember for the first three days of walking, my child's heart held on to the hope and the dream that we could stop on the third day and just reverse course. Mm -hmm. As an adult, I cannot believe that I believe this. As an adult, it is unimaginable that that child believe in this wish so much that in my mind, even now I could see my child's mind just believing that we would walk. And then on the third day we would halt and we would turn around and go back home. And I read, I remember this so clearly because on that third day, my father had to do to this, to now I realized he had to do the first, he had, to, he had for the first time to break my heart. Mm. He had as a father, to, he had to break his daughter's heart. He, after many, many, many moments of me complaining and calling out and wanting to go back, he finally stopped me in the road he bent down to my eye level. He looked me in the eye and he said, I'm sorry, daughter. They lied. 
we are not going home. Mm -hmm. We cannot go home. And I saw it in his eyes and how sad he was. And I finally realized that there was no more home to go back to. And I didn't want him to be in pain. And so I followed him and we walked for three more days and eventually ended up staying over and, and arriving to a uh, camp, um, my, my, uh, a village where my, we, my uncle and aunt lived. And then from there, we just had to keep on moving and, and, and leaving and moving from one village to another, one village to another, because what, again, I didn't know about the Khmerish policy. My father knew, all of Cambodia knew that the Khmer Rouge, the soldiers, the government, the anchor, the organization um, was not satisfied with just moving people from the cities to the villages. They were now going after people who they believe pose threats to their uh, to their mission, to their goal of creating a pure utopian agrarian society, a new Cambodia. And anybody and everybody who could speak up, who could stand up, who could fight, who could share their voice, who could raise their voice, who could say no, review as enemies of the states, whether that was real, imagined, or, or in their thoughts. And their one solution, their solution of, of Per, of, of getting rid of these enemies of the states was to purge and crush them. And so as we were living and hiding in these villages, the soldiers would come mostly at night, sometime during the day, and they would come and they would take in that first wave, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the musicians, the singers, the weavers, and then they, these people disappeared. And we learned later on that they would they were all, and, and they had all been executed. And then the soldiers would come back. And this time they gathered the students, the teachers, people who could read, people who could write. And they gathered the daughters and the sons and the mothers, the mothers and the children of these people. And then they also disappeared. I have been to Cambodia on over 40 different trips now a country the size of the state of Oklahoma is today littered with over 20,000 mass graves. Over a majority of these graves, over a million skulls have been accounted for in these graves. Majority of them were not killed with bullets, but with blunt instruments smashed in the back of their heads. We did not know what happened to the people who disappeared, but we knew when the soldiers came that we would not see them again. That is, that is a, chilling, a chilling account. And especially as a child to try to make sense of all of these things that are going on around you. So eventually, the soldiers came for your family and you and your sister were in a work camp. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? And as a child, what, what kind of work did they have you do? And where, where did your parents and your other siblings end up? Well, I was still holding on to hope, though it was small and growing smaller, that the war would end. One day it would end and we could still go back home. We could go back home and we could start our life anew and we could be together. Even though the fathers and other fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters were disappearing in our village, it wasn't until the soldiers arrived in our village two soldiers with their guns and their smile and their excuse that they needed my father to go with them to remove an ox cart stuck in the mud. And my father talked to my mother after he heard what the Khmeru said. And she began to cry in such a way that I've never heard her cry before. It was such a sound, it was 
a sound that was so heartbreaking that even as a child, I didn't know what it meant, but I knew, I knew that my mother's heart was breaking. And when my father left my mother, one by one, he came out of the hut and he picked up my brothers and sisters in his arms and held us for just a moment. When it was my time, I had the instinct of heart somehow, somewhere, to wrap my arms around my father's neck, to rest my face against his cheek, to tell him I loved him. And when he walked off with the, sun, with the soldiers into that sunset that night, the gods had painted the sky this palette of gold and magenta and pink and orange. And it was so beautiful. The sky was an image of heaven. And yet I remember there was only hurt and hate in my heart. And I prayed that night for my father to return. And when he didn't, Three days after that, I stopped praying for him to return. I started praying for his death be, to be quick and painless. I was seven years old. I was seven years old when I knew I would never see my father again. But still that tiny little hope still beat in my heart. And it was yet also filled with anger because as a child, my child's heart was not used to feeling all the emotions all at once. My child's heart was, I believe all children's heart felt emotions in such a pure way. When you're happy, you're happy. When you're joyful, you're joyful. When you're angry, you feel that anger. And it's really for the first time when I felt anger and rage and hurt and hate and pain all at once. And when my mother gathered us around, and, and after three months after my father was taken and said, you have to leave, you have to walk east, you have to go south. And my brothers left. And then my sister, Jew and I, I was seven and she was eight. And my mother said, we have to leave her. And I didn't want to leave her. And, I, and she said, I had to separate from my sister. We had to go to different work camps. And when I refused, she turned me by my shoulders, pushed me out the door and said, get out. I don't want you. I thought my mother was weak. I thought she didn't love me. I felt abandoned by her. My sister and I would eventually end up in a work, in a children's work camp, where for, from, from dawn to dusk, we grew food, we dug trenches, we didn't go to school. We grew food that, Trucks would come and take what food we grew and disappear and would bring back guns and munitions and arms to fight a war we didn't want, we didn't know anything about. We couldn't vote in, we did not vote in, we could not voice and protest again. And then the worker at the camp said, I have to leave my sister that we could not stay together because I was strong, because I was physically strong. They decided that I needed to go to a, another children's camp. And at this camp, I was not to be trained to think. I was not to be trained to be a critical thinker and to be a leader, to be a peacemaker. I was to be trained to be a child soldier. And instead of being taught to play, I was given guns half my body's height, a third my body's weight, and I was taught to shoot. And, in, and when, they, when it was time at night, and I was sitting there looking at the stars, I was told to stop dreaming. And instead, I was told stories of people who wanted to harm me, who wanted to hurt me, the, the, the Americans, the French, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, people who saw us saw Cambodia as a threat to their democracy. And in order for their nation to survive and to thrive, they would have to hurt us, to harm us, to take us out first. And the only way we could survive was to feed that hate, was to hurt somebody first. It breaks my heart really when I watch the news 
And I hear stories of how many children, how many, how many adults who have been raised in this hurt and hate, who then grew up to be a person who would then perpetrate such hurt and hate. It breaks my heart, but I also can understand. It is not unimaginable that if you breed hate, hate will somehow find a way to expand. I have no doubt that had my war not ended when I was nine, I would have been a very efficient killer. And what would have that done to my soul, to my spirit? How would I have healed that and not just my body, but to heal my soul so that I could be a productive person in our world? And how, Luong, how did the, how did the war end? How did you know, how, how did it come to an end for you? My book is written in a child's voice um, in the first person present tense. And I wanted to tell a story where people didn't know what was going on because I didn't know it. It's, now, now when I when I watch the news and I hear about what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in China, what happened in Rwanda, in Bosnia, I imagine, and it breaks my heart to, to imagine what the people in the country, what they must have been going through because we couldn't get information. We didn't have information. We didn't know what was going on. So for me, the war ended pretty much the same way it began with gunfires. And, and when the soldiers came in to our, in, into the city and started, and, and, and the Khmer's came and took power, they came with guns. And when the Vietnamese came into Cambodia on January 7th, 1979, when I was nine years old, they came in with guns. I was living, and, and this was three years, eight months and 20 days of living under the Khmer's regime in a time where I've already lost so many member families, been separated from my sibling, my brothers and sister. My, the soldiers had already come for my father. And a year after I left my mother, the soldiers also came for my mother and for your sister. So I was vulnerable and scared and was willing to do whatever the instructors at the child soldiers camp said I needed to do. And so when the gun fires came and exploded and hit the, sh the, the children's camp I was at and set it aflame. I didn't know what to do. I was nine years old. I got up with nothing, owning nothing and escaped the fire and ran toward the directions where I thought my sisters, uh, where I, I knew my sister's camp was. And I just ran. The Khmer Rouge was defeated on that day by the Vietnamese troops, 180,000 Vietnamese troops that would come into Cambodia and would defeat the Vietnamese and at the Khmer Rouge soldiers and then chase them into the, the jungle of Cambodia. And that was how the genocide in Cambodia came to an end. But for the people who lived through that, it was not yet an ending for us because now was the hard work of trying to find each other. When we were separate from each other, we didn't make plans of how we would find each other again. We didn't know how we would find each other. We didn't know where each other would be. We didn't have the technologies, the, the iPhones, the GPS, we didn't know. And so I eventually just started walking, following this mass of refugees and was lucky enough to eventually be reunited with my sister, Ju and my brother Kim, and my older bro surviving brothers. Hmm. In, in, that's an incredible story. And we have some photos um, of your siblings. Will you tell us who, who's in these photos? This is my brother Kim, uh, my brother Ming. He was 21, and I was 10, and my sister-in-law Ying. And this was the day we arrived at the refugee camp in Thailand. When we, when the war ended in Cambodia and the five surviving Ungs reunited, we looked around Cambodia in a land that had been decimated. And 
realizing we did not know the numbers by at, at the, at then, but we would find out later that in the span of the Khmer's regime, an estimated of 1.7 to 2.2 Cambodians died to starvation, disease, this is hard labor and execution. Among the victims in my families were both my parents, two sisters, and 20 other relatives. And after the war, we looked around Cambodia and just really wanting a, a, a chance to rebuild a new life. And there weren't schools and uh, there were few teachers to teach in the school and there were few schools that were left standing, few leaders and, and there were no jobs. And so my oldest brother Meng decided that we needed to leave Cambodia to go to another place. And back then, you, there were only two ways out of Cambodia. You either walk the land, which meant that we had to cross, we'd make our ways um, from Cambodia to Thailand, knowing that the borders of Thailand were, uh, were populated by these tiny little weapon systems called anti-personnel landmines. Weapon systems that were the size of a hockey puck, compact powder, um, coffee cup that once in a ground would stay active for decades. And they, the weapon system that does not care whether the foot that step on it was a friend or a foe. After the war, an average of 500 Cambodians were being maimed, killed, injured by these tiny little weapon systems. The other way out of Cambodia was through um, the boat people's route. But to do that, we had to raise three ounces of gold approximately about $40 American dollars then to buy seats in fishing vessels, fishing boats that would take us from Cambodia to Vietnam, from Vietnam to Thailand. And the picture that was shown before was after, um, was of my brother, sister and I arriving at the refugee in Thailand because that was the safer route. But to have this chance, to take this chance to rebuild a new life we were only able to find enough money to take three people out. My brother Meng had to choose one of four siblings to take with him. I don't know to this day how he made that decision. Which of the siblings would you take? Who would you leave behind? Knowing that the ones you take might never make it to safety and the ones you leave behind might never see tomorrow. And I was chosen because as a youngest sister, they believed that should I and should we make it to a safe place? And that safe place actually has schools where I could actually go and get an education and be taught by wonderful teachers who would change my life and my future. And I'm again, filled with gratitude for the teachers who taught me and gave me a new life that as a youngest child, I would have the most number of years to get an education. Eventually, we would find this magical land called Vermont, Essex Junction, Vermont, where we were given that chance. Um, and there's the picture of my brother, my sister, and I arriving in Vermont that very first day. At the refugee camp, what little money we had left my brother Meng saved to buy me a brand new white shirt because I wanted to arrive in America in style. I wanted to look nice. And so I had my hair cut and my brother bought me that brand new white shirt, which he kept in a nice, beautiful plastic bag so that it wasn't wrinkled. And when we got off the plane, uh, well, when the captain announced that we were landing and it was in English, so we didn't understand, we quickly um, put the shirt on me and I quickly buttoned the shirt. And it was only much later that I realized I buttoned the shirt wrong. <laughs> Can you all see that my button was off? <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I wish I actually buttoned the shirt right, but I arrived to where and my brother and sister did not have the money to buy themselves new shirts. So I was the only one that came and arrived to America in style. Hmm. I never would have noticed the buttons. <laughs> um, Luang, I have one last question for you before we open it up to questions from those who are participating. 
So if you're watching, please feel free to type any questions you have into the Q&A. I, I have like a hundred questions for you. So I'm, I'm trying to narrow it down to one last one. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, can you tell us after you wrote your book, how, how did your family react to your book? And, and what, what did they say about you sharing these, these stories and this history of your family? Again, I wrote my first book from um, really was to give to the gift to my nieces and nephews. And so and so it was a process of taking my journals and and turning in them into a book. And um, and there's the cover of, of the different books in different languages. I actually after I wrote the book and was really fortunate enough that um, I was able to, uh, that, that I received a publishing contract. And even with that, I, I found an agent when I wrote the book and, and, um, and the agent sent it to 25 publishers and um, I received 24 rejections, mm -hmm. but you only need one yes. You only need one yes. And that was always Mrs. Knapp, my sixth grade teacher said to me, things can happen in life, but you only need one yes to move forward. And that one yes can come from anywhere. It can come from your parents, can come from your teachers, can come from your friends. So you want to surround yourself with, um, with people who will be your biggest supporters. I am, I was going to say I'm very sorry for the teachable moments that I often think about when I'm speaking to students, but this is the wonderful, this is a great group to share teachable moments with. <laughs> um, I actually had the book translated to English and to Khmer, and I gave the, uh, my siblings all a copy. And I said to them, you could veto out any chap chapters, any sentences, anything you want. And if you don't want me to tell our story, you could rip them all up. And then I would not tell the story. I, I would just not publish the book. But in, in, in preparation to wanting, still I wanted to convince them to let me do it. I actually printed the UN Declarations of Human Rights and took that to Cambodia with me when I presented them the book. And I was going to tell them and was going to speak to them why we needed to do this, that this isn't really isn't just our story. This is the story of Cambodia. This is the story of humanity. This is the story of family that just happened to take place in a war. And, and, and my brother, and actually the book cover of First They Killed My Father had uh, has my eyes covered because I wanted to tell them that it's the Luang own story in words, but if you cover the girl's eyes, it could be any girl's story. It could be a girl in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in different places. Amazingly enough, well, not really amazing when you understand the human heart um, as, as I eventually would, my brothers and sister, without me having to show them, without understanding and even knowing anything about the UN Declarations of Human Rights said, do it. Just, you don't need to tell us. We know what happened. We want people to know. And it occurred to me that a human knows when their rights have been violated, whether they know the words or the English, uh, the language or the laws. Humans know when our rights and our soul have been violated and have been harmed. Um, and so they were very supportive and they were very happy. And then um, they were, they thought it was supremely funny when we actually turned the book into a movie and they all came to the movie premiere in America. They, my brother and sister have actually never been to America and their first trip to America was to a movie premiere in Hollywood. <laughs> How crazy was that? Wow. Well, actually, that's a great segue to one of the first questions that I've got here from one of our audience members who says that she has read the book. She has not seen the movie. And is the movie, do you feel like the movie is true to your story? And how did you end up working with Angelina Jolie? Well, first thing, and the Angelina Jolie and I have been friends for um, over 23 years now. When my book came out in 2000, 
first I killed my father came out in 2000. Angelina was making a movie called Tomb Raiders in Cambodia. And um, she purchased the book from a street vendor. And um, I am always telling her she owes me a dollar in royalty, right? So she never paid up. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, she called me up and we have been friends ever since. We have common bonds in our work. She is uh, and was working as the UN ambassador for refugees for many, many, many years. And there is um, the 2000, I think this picture was circa 2000, when Angie and I went to visit a minefield in Cambodia. And um, so we we just were, we've been very good friends and decided she wanted to tell the story of Cambodia and to tell the story of rent landmines. And it was, it, it was an amazing experience for me to the the movie. I wrote the book when I was 30 years old and, you know, my heart and my mind was full of anger. There, There's a picture of us at the movie premiere and for my family's privacy, because Cambodia is a very small, small place. Um, we um, we didn't post the pictures with them, but they were very, very happy. And those for the cast kids and Angie and her family and the producer um, at the film premiere. And the book, when I wrote the book, my heart was still full of anger and of rage and confusion. And when I made the movie, it we wanted to, it, it's, it's still the protagonist, the story's the same, but we wanted to incorporate more, uh, you know, a tone and notes of forgiveness, of healing, of Buddhism, of spirituality. And I wanted to share that. I wanted more. And so there, there are some scenes where we actually, the particular, if, if you've read the book and you watched the movie, you know that we changed the ending because we wanted to end it on a note of Buddhism and forgiveness. Um, and the educated teachers out there may be interested that for the twin, for um, the 25th anniversary of the book's publication in 2025, I'm actually in the process of adapting the book into a graphic novel. And um, in this edition, so I believe that First I Killed My Father was written with a lot of raw emotions and raw anger and raw feelings. The film was a lot more of, of, of healing and, and spirituality. The, the graphic novel, I wanted to include more Khmer arts and Khmer mythology and, and the beauty of the land. And so it's gonna be a bit more, um, spirit, it's it's gonna be a lot more, I'm incorporating a lot more mythology because I love Khmer mythology and Khmer Buddhism. I love that. So I love the sound of this. When when will this be available? When are you aiming for? Well, we're aiming for April 2025 in, okay. in to, to in celebration of the 25th anniversary of First They Killed My Father. Um, it's publication. Awesome. It, it's I again thank you to all the teachers out there because as as you know, um, well, as as readers, when you publish a book and you you and, and they're in bookstores, if you're privileged enough and blessed enough to have them be sold in all the wonderful bookstores, people will pick up one of copies or two copies. But when the books, um, when my books are, are taught by professors and teachers, Stanford University was, uh, taught it and, and they purchased 2,500 copies mm -hmm. at once. Um, and so when the book came out, I prayed to the Buddha that I would sell all of 10 copies. I made sure that my goal was really low so <laughs> I would feel good. And um, it has so many more copies than that. And, and it's because of all the teachers out there teaching the books and thank you so much. That is so, so wonderful. Congratulations on just this huge success. Um, Luang, a number of people have written in with very similar questions, wanting to know what happened to your siblings who did not leave Cambodia. My brother Kim, my brother Ming, and I, and sister-in-law Erin came to Vermont, and now we Vermont is home. I'm in where I'm at right now. My brother Kim eventually made his way through to France, and then we sponsored him to America legally. It took us 12 years, but he is now in LA. He's married and he's with his wife and children in LA. And my sister Ju remains, and my brother Koi remains in Cambodia. Ju is now a grandmother for 
there's Stu. Um, my sister Stu and I are we're still the best of friends, and she mm -hmm. is a grandmother for the eighth time. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, I have to say she's a greedy woman because I am now 53 years old. There are all her children. And, and um, every time I go to Cambodia for years, she was still trying to push me to have babies. Um, <laughs> I said that I, 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 Mark and I, my husband, Mark and I chosen not to be parents, but we have we're wonderful aunts and uncle, um, aunts and uncles. And my my sister, um, we're we're close. She is she's still in Cambodia and I. I go back at least once a year and I have made over 40 plus trips, 45 plus trips now to Cambodia. Amazing. Um, Luang, another question here is, would you please tell us a little bit about your experiences in the US after you arrived and were you sponsored by a family? We were sponsored by the Holy Family Church Group in Essex Junction, Vermont. And we will be seeing our sponsor, the Lucentes, in in the, um, in Boston very soon mm -hmm. this summer. I am, I'm so great. Just, just you know, we often when we watch the news, we are shown instances of man's inhumanity to man and man's unkindness to man. And because in the news media they have a slogan that they follow, and it goes like this: "If it bleeds, it leads." And yet in my life, I've experienced so much kindness. Marty Lucenti, uh, who was, who was a, a parishioner at the Holy Family Church, watched the news program one day and saw the story of Cambodia and then went to his church the next week, that Sunday, and uh, got up and stood up in front of the, uh, the parishioner and the people and said, I want to help a Cambodian family came, come to Vermont. Who would help me? And mm -hmm. before he finished his sentence, he said, all the hands went up. And so we were sponsored by the church and we came because it, the work to help somebody have a chance at a second life is immense. Mm -hmm. it, it needs more than one person to extend that helping hand. You need somebody to help you learn how to cross the road, to take you to the market, to how to shop for food, to tell you that when you pick up a copy of the Burlington, Burlington Free Press, you actually have to pay. Even though by the time I was learning English a little bit, we like it, it said Burlington Free Press. But no, you actually have to pay. The press, press is free, but the paper you have to pay. To teach us about um, to teach us about meatloaf. What is meatloaf? <laughs> you know, in my culture, unless there's spice in it and the spice makes your scalp sweat, it's meats together cooked in a pan is, is not actually all that great. <laughs> And also you need sponsors to sit with you every single 4th of July or during our first 4th of July to tell us that the fireworks going about to go off in the sky were not actually bombs. They're not actually the soldiers coming back or finding me in America. That 1st of July, I was so re-traumatized. That first 4th of July, I mean, I was so re-traumatized because the fireworks went off and I did not understand why the Americans were not running for cover. And it took Linda Costello to just sit with me to explain to me what the fireworks were all about. Um, and, and, and teaching us about Thanksgiving and Halloween and all the things that goes with building a new life. It is not enough to extend one helping hand. We have to extend many, many, many helping hands to help somebody build a life. That is such an important message to, to help us end on is, as you said, it, it takes many of us to, to help out and it's our responsibility to step forward when needed. Um, I, I wonder, um, is there a, something that you're working on now that you'd like to share with us or something um, that you would recommend for those who want to help more what we could do? I believe in taking actions and be in, in acting and in, in, you know, it's growing up watching American TV the one time I made the mistake of watching and there's nothing wrong with it the people who enjoyed the Miss America pageant it is true what 
people seem to make fun of them and and that when people come up and say i wish for world peace it used to and still does drive me nuts mm. peace is not a wish peace is not a dream Peace is not something we expect our leaders to deliver. Peace is not something we expect the Seattle Holocaust Center to only dedicate their time on. Peace is not something we want others to work on and we take no responsibilities for ourselves. Peace is an action. Peace is many, many, many actions, whether it's in our heart, in our community, at our school, in our home, in our relationships. Peace is something we decide on, dedicate our time, choose on a daily basis. When we look in the mirror that first thing in the morning, we can choose to have a peaceful drive, have a peaceful day, choose peace to smile, choose peace to be kind, choose peace to be gracious, choose peace to be generous, choose peace to be present. Peace is a choice. It is an action. It is something we do. Choose peace to make a difference. And it matter not whether you choose my form of peace. And I believe in working on to eradicate landmines from our ground. And you could go on the, my website, luangung.com, to learn more about how we um, work to remove landmines from the ground and also to raise money to manufacture prosthetic limbs, wheelchairs to help victims of landmines. That could be your choice. You could also choose to beautify the neighborhood, to fight fires in Canada. There are so many things. In the U.S. alone right now, we have over 1.5 million charitable organizations registered. Worldwide, there are millions of Organize, charitable organize, organization registers. Choose peace by listening to the vibrations of your heartstrings. When you watch something, see something, hear something, feel something, notice the vibration of your heartstrings and whether or not it's going to twang just like a guitar all over your body, the muscles, your heart, and then follow that vibration to your peace work. And then do it. For an hour a day, a week a month, a day a year, a dollar a, a, a month, whatever it is that is within your ability, in your capacity, in your um, in your in, in, in your family, choose it together and do it on a daily basis, because that is the only way we can make this world a safer and better place for all. It is by all of us choosing peace together, working on peace together. And just like my six-year-old niece who just said it every day, do it. <laughs> when I don't want to do something, she said, do it. I, it's, it's now ringing in my head. Luang, you have inspired me. And I know I speak for all of us when I say you have inspired so, so many. And I love your words that peace is not a wish, it's an action. And I hope that's something that we can all take away from your incredible passion and your integrity and just your willingness to be so open. Thank you so, so much for being with us today and for sharing these stories. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, a big shout out to all the teachers out there. You've already chosen your piece. <laughs> and I know you are all inspiring your students. Think of how many, it actually is, is amazing. Think of how many students you've all combined, inspired in your, lifetime in Korea, that's actually quite a large number. A uh, large number. And, and so I am very grateful that, that you're chosen the, the work you're in and that you are making a difference. And to like Mr. Severance, who did not know what a difference he made in my life. And I mm -hmm. said to him, all the students, all the times you were there for me, even if I never visited and came even if I never went back to him I hope he knows and I hope you know the difference you made is changing the world and making it better thank you thank you so so much Luang and thank you to all of you for joining this program and for your wonderful questions I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to all of them and all of your comments in the chat I'm seeing them come in We'll make sure we save it and we'll share it with Luang so she can see all of these comments and questions coming as well from all of you. One of the 
biggest compliments you can give us if you liked this program is please share it with a friend or a colleague or a family member or share it on your social media platform of choice and tag the Holocaust Center. This helps other people to find our programs and to learn from these amazing speakers and stories. Our next Lunch and Learn program will be in September. Stay tuned for a really outstanding and thought-provoking lineup of speakers in the fall. In the meantime, I'm sure there are a couple of Lunch and Learns you might have missed, and you can find them all on our website. Just click on the Lunch and Learn page and then select Past Lunch and Learns. Our fantastic team at the Holocaust Center makes all of these programs possible. A special thank you to Richard Green, our technology director, who is running this Lunch and Learn program behind the scenes, and Brenda Anderson, our teaching and learning specialist, who is running the many details of today's day of learning, and Dee Simon, our outstanding CEO, and also thank you to our amazing entire team, Lori Werschel cohen Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Morgan Romero, Amanda Davis, Katie Lawrence, Anna Morris, and Lexi Jason. Thank you again to everyone for joining today's program. This concludes our program for today, and we hope to see you at the next one in September.